Hello, and this presentation is called Edward O. Wilson's Two Great Descents. And Edward O. Wilson is a famous evolutionary biologist who helped introduce uh, social biology. So he's known uh, for primarily uh, the controversy surrounding his first uh, major public book, or aimed at a more general audience. And this was a massive work called Social Biology, The New Synthesis, that came out in 1976. And it caused a great uproar, uh, not among biologists, but among social scientists. And this was because he had a concluding chapter on humans where he said that the humanities and social sciences will shrink to specialized branches of biology and called for the integration of the social sciences with evolutionary biology. And this produced a tremendous uproar. Uh, more recently, he's published another book among about 20 books that he's written called The Social Conquest of Earth. So this just came out in 2012. It's very much aimed at a general audience. And for biologists, uh, the most controversial part of this book is what he has to say about inclusive fitness theory or Hamilton's rule. He says inclusive fitness theory is both mathematically and biologically incorrect. So now the uproar isn't among social scientists, but it's among evolutionary biologists. And many of them have very vigorously uh, countered Wilson on this argument. So our question is, well, what could be wrong uh, with Hamilton's rule in inclusive fitness? And Wilson points to empirical problems. So it's a profoundly difficult rule to measure in practice. And then Martin Nowak, among other uh, mathematicians, have argued that it has theoretical problems. And this is because different biologists apply different definitions of R or relatedness. So to explain the rule, uh, we use genealogy or a pedigree. But there's other ways you can define R. You can define it by comparing a whole genome and drawing a regression line between the two genomes. Uh, that's been used. You can compare it by focusing on organisms that happen to share a particular allele and ignore whether or not they're genealogically related at all. And that's been done. So uh, others have pointed to these problems, the ambiguity in how R is measured. Uh, but for Wilson, probably the key thing was it explained very little about ants, termites, bees, and wasps. Uh, those insects known as the Hymenoptera. And this is Wilson's specialty, particularly the ants. So on the left here, we see leafcutter ants on their way home with leaves that they've cut or fragments of leaves. And on the right, a beehive. And Wilson argues that for all of the effort that's been put into Hamilton's rule, the empirical results have been mediocre and that more has been learned simply through careful observation of ants and termites, bees, and wasps uh, than through hypothesis testing. So he's also caused something of an uproar by arguing that a more inductive approach is called for uh, that starts with observations. Now a question arises, uh, if uh, Wilson is right, so if not inclusive fitness, uh, then what? Uh, what's going to replace it? And his answer is twofold. One is individual selection, uh, plain old generic ordinary Darwinism, direct fitness of parents and offspring and uh, grand offspring. And the other, group selection. So, of course, given how vigorously group selection was uh, turned against in the 1960s and 70s, this is also very controversial. And Wilson favors biological group selection, whereas we'll see when it comes to human behavior, uh, many others favor cultural group selection. 
And in Wilson's view, uh, this gives us two parts of human nature. Uh, part of our human nature is shaped by individual competition within groups, and that gives us our self-interestedness. And part of our human nature is shaped by group selection. And Wilson seems to suggest that many of what we call virtues, our desire for equality and fairness, uh, honor, um, and loyalty, these all come out of group selection. So there's this big contrast that he uh, focuses on. You have these two levels of selection that are both acting, and he argues that there's an inherent and irremediable conflict in human society between the operation of natural selection at the individual level and at the group level, and as a result, we've adapted to both of these. And what we get uh, from the individual competition within societies is our selfishness, altruism, and pro-social behaviors, he argues, has been the result of group selection. So the genetic fitness of a human being must therefore be, uh, is his conclusion, a combination of both individual selection and group selection. And uh, these selfless and selfish dimensions of human behavior have different uh, selective roots. So the question is, well, is it all good, uh, group selection? And another uh, biologist named David uh, Sloan Wilson argues that group selection takes us out of the frying pan and into the fire. So the frying pan is individual competition within groups. Uh, but the fire is a competition between groups. And although that may uh, produce loyalty and altruism, it also produces war and genocide and ethnocentrism. And this is a general argument among contemporary proponents of group selection that not just our pro-social and altruistic tendencies, but also some of the nastiest aspects of group behavior among humans are a product of group selection. So the question is, well, who wins? Is it our selfish side or our altruistic side? And Wilson argues it's both. So he, the basis of this that we'll look at more closely is that an iron rule exists in genetic social evolution. Selfish individuals beat altruistic individuals, while groups of altruists beat groups of selfish individuals. And what do we win? Well, we win uh, dominance in the terrestrial ecosystems of the Earth. So Wilson points out in his book, The Social Conquest of Earth, that there's two hegemonic uh, species on the planet. Uh, one are the ants, and if you took the trillions of ants and added them all up into one big mass of biomass, they'd form one cubic mile or more. And they're the result uh, their societies of what he calls civilization by instinct. So the ants are farmers, they build cities, they fight wars, they have a, a developed division of labor. And especially impressive are the leaf cutter ants. So if you're interested, there's a book by Wilson and another uh, specialist in ants called The Leaf Cutter Ants Civilization by Instinct. The other hegemon, though, is humans, and uh, we're catching up quickly with the ants. If you took all of the 7 billion humans today and stacked us up, we'd also form one cubic mile of biomass, just like the ants. But as we mentioned, uh, we make use each year of one cubic mile of oil, and on top of that, almost one cubic mile of coal and then about a half cubic mile of gas so that we uh, have a much greater ecological impact than just our numbers might suggest. Now ants, when you're thinking about them, these are photos of, uh, of what are called crazy ants that are spreading rapidly across the deep south. So from Texas to Florida, 
And these are literally uh, masses of ants in people's houses. And that's just a huge pile of dead crazy ants within someone's house. And here you can see the plumbing and the ants all around it on a patio. And so these would drive people crazy. Uh, but in Wilson's uh, argument and other biologists, ants are keystone species and ecosystems. So he argues about insects generally, that if we were to wipe out the insects on this planet, the rest of life and humanity with it would mostly disappear from the land within a few months. So life would continue in the oceans and the bacteria would continue, uh, but all of the larger uh, forms of life would disappear quickly. And when we're thinking about that, two-thirds of the insects are the ants. And Wilson points out that they're the primary undertakers of the world. They remove the dead. They turn the soil. They remove debris. Um, they move more soil than earthworms. And so they provide a lot of important ecological functions. Uh, humans, on the other hand, are something else in terms of our impact. And Wilson suggests that a key difference is timing, and this relates to coevolution. So the ants, uh, he says, insinuated themselves with quiet little steps, each taking millions of years, and other species had a chance to adjust to them, and so they gradually took this dominant position in ecosystems, that, uh, but they did it without massive displacement of other species. Humans, on the other hand, have taken off at a very rapid exponential rate uh, much more recently. And this means we've largely been displacing other forms of life rather than co-evolving with them. An exception, and that shows that shift that we did earlier uh, between the biomes of the world in 1700 and the anthromes of today. Uh, uh, exception are the species that we have come to rely on, the domestic livestock and cultigens. And for example, the number of cattle is expanded to over a billion. There's about a billion pigs. If we add up the goats and the sheep, uh, we get almost a billion of those. And then there's uh, hundreds of millions of acres of cultigens that we planted, including 300 million acres of corn. So our cultigens and domesticates have expanded along with us, uh, but in, the, in turn that has displaced um, what we call natural ecosystems and species that aren't directly useful to us for food. So thank you for listening.